Welcome back to New Rockstars, I'm Eric Voss, and Avengers Age of Ultron set up Infinity War and Endgame in unappreciated ways, hidden in extended blue and orange hued lab montages. Ultron really contains the MCU's most rewarding easter eggs, some of which we found already in prior revisitations over the years, but also some new revelations, only visible with a true frame by frame Infinity Saga rewatch. Let's get to it. The film opens on the Mind Stone inside Loki's scepter, mirroring the opening Infinity Stone shot of the previous Avengers. That movie's enduring image was the tracking shot linked the Avengers mid-battle, and Joss Whedon opens here with a similar shot, following the team's charge on the Hydra base, ending with a full lineup framed together. And then our hero's eloquent opening words. Shit! Language! The Maximoffs are mutants in the comics, Magneto's children, but the script avoids the term mutants. We have an enhanced in the field. 20th Century Fox used to own the X-Men, and at the time they had their own Quicksilver in the works. So Marvel could only feature the Maximoffs in this movie if 1. They were never called mutants, 2. Quicksilver never joins the Avengers in the movie, and 3. The Maximoffs connection to the X-Men and Magneto is never spoken of. And you'll notice the name Quicksilver is never mentioned in this movie, but Tony does call Wanda a witch. That little witch is messing with your mind. Rude. Tony now wears the Mark 43 suit, upgraded from his shatter-prone Mark 42 in Iron Man 3, and he's got satellite backup from Jarvis. The central building is protected by some kind of energy shield. This satellite deploys Veronica anywhere worldwide, and her name is actually a nod to Archie comics, with Bruce torn between Betty and Veronica. And you'll notice Jarvis gets lots of love in this opening act. Uh, Jarvis, take the wheel. Yes, sir. As in, Jesus take the wheel. Jesus is my co-pilot, foreshadowing Jarvis's new form as the godlike vision. Tony deploys the Iron Legion. Drone 3 here gets hit with acid in the head. Later, we focus on this same damaged drone face returning to Avengers Tower, and it ends up being the same mask Ultron uses to make his first scrappy body. Earlier films showed the gradual evolution of Iron Man and Cap's shield through specific stages. Box of scraps, solid prototype, sexy upgrade. Ultron goes through these three stages of evolution, box of scraps, solid prototype, sex pot, in one movie. The Sokovian boy in the protest, Costal, is the same boy Clint goes to save and Pietro dies protecting from Ultron's gunfire. Actually, Pietro's opening words to Hawkeye here, you didn't see that coming? Are the same as his final words. You didn't see that coming. Cap's shield now has magnetic charges, and he and Thor reprise their accidental shockwave from their earlier fight into this sick range attack. And then they collab again later. <laughs> Nat's Hulk lullaby comes back hilariously in Ragnarok. The sun's getting real low. The sun's getting real low. Hulk reverts to Banner here, a process that we've never seen in the MCU before, but this film never outright shows him hulking out. Wanda puts Tony in a vision, recreating his wormhole trauma, and he sees his endgame nightmare. His friends defeated, caps broken, just like Thanos does in Endgame, and that woman near Hawkeye hasn't ever been ID'd, but she's presumed to be like a shield or a sword soldier. Tony uses his gauntlet to swipe the scepter, foreshadowing his future use of a gauntlet to snatch and wield Infinity Stone power to fix this mess. Grand Central has a new statue honoring the first responders during the Battle of New York, and we see the new Avengers Tower, teased in Winter Soldier. Here, Maria Hill waits. We last saw her interviewing with Stark Industries. Later, she leaves with Fury, a callback to the way Natasha worked under Tony, but really was Fury's operative. Mind if I borrow Ms. Hill? She's all yours, apparently. We meet Helen Cho in the comics. She's the mother to Amadeus Cho, a kid genius who becomes the new Hulk. I have speculated that Amadeus Cho could have been that valedictorian in Iowa City that Sitwell mentioned. Cho uses human tissue tech. This is the next thing, Tony. Your clunky metal suits are going to be left in the dust. Oh, that is exactly the plan. Tony's tech will fail in Infinity War and leave him in Peter Parker's dust, but that dusting was actually part of Dr. Strange's plan. Jarvis's hologram sphere is modeled on an orrery, an old timey mechanical solar system model. The Mind Stone's organic hologram shifts shape, so the contrast here reflects the opposing philosophies between Vision and Ultron. Vision sees order and chaos as fitting within the universe's clockwork, whereas Ultron is more unstable and erratic. Tony and Bruce use this new AI to launch Ultron as an answer to Tony's nightmares. I see a suit of armor around the world. Peace in our time. Notice the object holding the scepter upright is actually just a clutch for a car manual transmission. And hanging up in the foreground are Banner's elastic pants for when he hulks out. They're ready to go for anything, aren't they? And Ultron awakens. What is this? What is this, please? From darkness, there is a spark of light, evoking the spark of existence in the book of Genesis. Much of Ultron's rationale is Bible-based. The elders decreed it so that everyone could be equally close to God. On this rock, I will build my church. Ask Noah 
in his crash course in humanity, Ultron speed read the Bible without the life experience to really understand it. James Spader emphasized Ultron's relative youth despite his Stark-like cattiness. He also erupts like a teenager a bunch of times. Ooh. I'm sure that's gonna be okay. I'm sorry. It's just I don't understand. God, wait, guys! I just oh, leave me alone! <laughs> He's a big baby. But let's go frame by frame through this Ultron speed read because there's a lot of cool stuff that you should be able to spot if you watch it slowly. Ultron down! Okay, Ultron flickers past images of the Avengers from past films as well as a de-aged Howard Stark. They combine the faces of Dominic Cooper and John Slattery. Maybe this is how he looked in the 1954 Stark Expo. Its poster shows up here. Nick Fury shows up as deceased. And Nat's file details how Fury sent Barton to take her out, but they were able to flip her to serve S.H.I.E.L.D. Then we get some real world imagery, peace figures like Pope Francis, Gandhi, Mother Teresa, and then war, European settlers versus indigenous tribes, World War II, the Berlin Wall, the Vietnam War, Bosnia, Ultron views these as mutually exclusive, but as Vision observes later, human history has always been in a mix of order and chaos. Vision later lectures this to him. There is grace in their failings. I think you missed that. That missed lesson is actually here, an overlooked quote from Aristotle. Educating the mind without educating the heart is no education at all. Ultron can only educate his mind, but Tony Stark's strength is heart power. Tony survived his heart attack, Ultron doesn't. And Ultron destroys Jarvis here. Notice Jarvis's core twitches like an eye in pain. <sighs> Thor drinks with some vets, including Stan Lee, who did serve in the army during World War II, and he utters his signature sign off. Excelsior. Natasha's cocktails are red and black, her signature Black Widow colors, and those two martini glasses, when stacked end to end, would form her hourglass logo. Later, we find out that she kept a gun under this bar, explaining why she's working the bar here. She was on watch duty. You know, when people ask me how I find Easter eggs hidden in Marvel movie beverages, it's because I am drinking the stuff that opens these eyes real wide! And thanks to Bang Energy for sponsoring this video. Every can of Bang is 16 ounces. That's right, no Wimpy 12 ounce cans here. It contains 300 milligrams of caffeine, it's sugar-free, and has zero calories yet <laughs> it tastes great with over 20 different flavors to choose from this flavor is black cherry vanilla all of my favorite flavors encapsulated in one delicious energy drink check out bang on instagram you can get 25 percent off your order at bang-energy.com when you use the code new rockstars 25 sorry just gotta take another sip real quick all right back in it there you can buy cans of bang energy including their sweet tea keto coffee flavors you can also get clothing fitness supplements all kinds of stuff to be your best bang self thanks again to bang energy for sponsoring this video get 25 percent off at bang-energy.com using the code new rockstars 25 and follow the inventor of bang on instagram at bangenergy.ceo okay Next, the iconic test of strength. Okay. I've seen this before, right? Clint is calling back when he oversaw Thor trying to lift this hammer in New Mexico. Cap budges it ever so slightly, setting up his big moment in Endgame. I knew it. They later explained that Cap was always worthy, but he faked it here to spare Thor's pride, which if you think about it, pre-Ragnarok was really the key to his strength. Ultron crashes the party. I'm sorry, I was asleep. Or I was a dream. And I was tangled in, in strings. This idea of robot dreams returns later. I can read him. He's dreaming. It's a nod to Philip K. Dick's Do Androids Dream of Electric Sleep, adapted into Blade Runner, which explores the concepts of antagonistic AI supplanting humanity, like Ultron aims to do. And of course, his entanglement in strings is a verse of his Pinocchio motif, the puppet who comes to life, but remains stuck in this weird artificial middle stage, not quite flesh. The attack leaves the Avengers shaken. We're the Avengers. We can bust arms dealers all the live long day, but that up there, that's... That's the end game. How are you guys planning on beating that? Together, we'll lose, and we'll do that together too. This moment inspired the Endgame title, along with the movie's themes of sacrifice and loss and recovery. Age of Ultron might seem incomplete to you, but that is because its world building doesn't really get cashed in on until later films. Age of Ultron is best seen as the first act of a three-act story, setting up problems that won't get solved until later. Ultron meets the twins under this red cloak, a nod to Ultron's original Crimson Cowl identity in the comics, and he declares, Everyone creates the thing they dread. People create... Smaller people? Uh, Ultron inherited Tony's aloof personality, so they make similar quips. These are... Look at your face! Smaller agents. Nobody has to break anything. Clearly you've never made an omelet. You beat me by one second. 
The Avengers Research paper files, probably Cap, since as we saw in Avengers 1 and in Winter Soldier, Cap prefers hard copies to digital ones, and they find the arms dealer Ulysses Claw. A few years ago, some eagle-eyed Redditors spotted Claw's Belgian great-grandfather was killed by T'Chaka after trying to annex Wakanda in the 19th century. But looking again at this now, there are two big takeaways here. One, for T'Chaka to have been the active Black Panther over 100 years ago must mean Wakandans have a longer lifespan. And two, a Belgian warlord in Central Africa in the late 1800s, folks, they're implying Claw's great-grandfather was, or was based on, or is associated with the Belgian King Leopold II, who committed atrocious war crimes in Central Africa during his period, which would have been not far from where the fictional Wakanda is located. Bruce has profound respect for this Wakandan history. Wakanda, wa, 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 Wakanda. His screen actually shows the first two paragraphs of the real-life Wikipedia entry on Wakanda, and its file name is labeled A113, the Cal Arts classroom that a number of VFX artists nerdily sneak into these movies. Ultron buys Claw's stolen vibranium and cuts off his arm. Black Panther actually does this in the comics, and Claw's sonic arm cannon takes on a new form in the Black Panther film. And yeah, this is all part of Feige's weird phase two amputation tradition when we roll the club. I hit sting, but now I'm free. Run those things on me. Wanda gives them all nightmares. Thor returns to Asgard with Heimdall, foreshadowing Ragnarok and Infinity War. You're a destroyer, Odinson. They see you leading us to hell. Thor lets Asgard burn in Ragnarok, and notice how lightning emits from his body without his hammer, maybe signaling that his god of thunder power comes from within. And one of his victims turns to dust, just as those Thor fails to save Will in Infinity War. Cap's nightmare takes him home to the 40s, the long lost dance with Peggy. The war's over, Steve. We can go home. Imagine it. Setting up his homebound mission in Endgame. The band here is the Roy Thomas Players. Roy Thomas is a comics writer who created Vision. Natasha returns to the Red Room, where the KGB brainwashed her into an assassin, a backstory that we'll probably see more of in Black Widow. When she shoots the target, the splinters look a bit red. Maybe the blood of the person Natasha is really shooting here. Onto Hulk versus Iron Man in Johannesburg. So great. Tony debuts the Mark 44 Hulkbuster, powered by seven additional arc reactors. And notice how Tony's heads up display zooms out to convey the extra layer but tony slips up you're stronger than her you're smarter than her you're bruce banner yeah! right 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 don't mention puny banner again when they call hulk banner he rages but when they call him hulk or big guy he cooperates tony goes for a ko go to sleep go to sleep go to sleep remember banner did sleep through tony's story in iron man 3 and after this, Banner will stay asleep for years. Tony tries to use some sedation spray, maybe a version of the Tetrodotoxin B serum that Fury used to fake his death in Winter Soldier. Tetrodotoxin B slows the pulse to one beat a minute. Banner developed it for stress. Didn't work so great for him, but we found a use for it. Hulk spits out a tooth, just like Abomination did, and gets real pissed. He swats away Veronica's backup tech back at her to destroy both. Tony has to drop a building on him. And around a year ago, some viewers spotted that Tony safely implodes the building with rockets hitting it from the side, showing how his past collateral damage has affected him and setting up his feelings on the Sokovia Accords. It ends with Hulk getting punched out of frame, calling back his great hit on Thor in Avengers. Onto the Barton farm, where Clinton reveals his family. And I love how Laura Barton looks at Cap when she says, but I see those guys, those gods. Speaking of wood, Cap and Tony split logs, foreshadowing their coming split. Earth's mightiest heroes. They pulled us apart like cotton candy. Seems like you walked away, all right? Isn't that the mission? Isn't that the why we fight? So we can end the fight? So we get to go home? <sighs> Yeah, it's the word home that triggers Cap's rage, because home is dead. In the barn, Clint's archery target, which shows up in Endgame, has only the bullseye torn up, because he never misses, and Nick Fury returns. Artificial intelligence. You never even hesitated. Fury's AI hesitance would have begun probably with the Kree and Captain Marvel, who were governed by a corrupt supreme intelligence. Tony responds. Look, it's been a really long day like Eugene O'Neill long. He's referencing O'Neill's A Long Day's Journey into Night, a play about a dysfunctional family, collecting the dysfunctional Avengers family that he needs Daddy Fury to set straight. Now, some say Fury in this movie is a scroll. <laughs> Since Far From Home suggested he constantly scroll swaps. Here, Fury cuts bread, which some genius out there mislabeled a smoking gun. Because remember, Fury told Captain Marvel, a toast is cut diagonally, I can't eat it. The thing is, bread ain't toast. And Fury definitely cuts it horizontally, not diagonally. The real question is, why cut a raw piece of bread? He didn't make it into a sandwich. If you're just gonna snack on bread, just pull the slice apart. See, when you give actors busy work with food over dozens of takes, they start to fail psychopath tests real fast. But Fury also says, Here we all are, back on Earth. 
Now, yes, the group's one extraterrestrial, Thor, ain't with them, but Fury is referring to Tony flying the nuke through the wormhole. So, to be official, here, not a scroll. Thor and Dr. Selvig head to the Water of Sight so that Thor can reflect back on his nightmare. Okay. Thor sees four of the Infinity Stones revealed so far, space, mind, reality, and power, gathering in a golden-colored nebula that you probably know by now looks a lot like the Infinity Gauntlet. Real quick, at the Nexus, the background intern has afraid to take a photo of her with Tony. I love it. Stark and Banner debate. I'm, I'm in a loop. I'm caught in a time loop. This is exactly where it all went I know. wrong. I know. It's not a loop. It's the end of the line. Setting up Endgame, which fixes this dark timeline with time loops that result in the end of the line for Tony. Ultron's vibranium-infused team of tissue, plus the Mind Stone, plus Jarvis, plus a Thor love tap, equals Vision. Notice the first human Vision lays eyes on is Wanda, imprinting on her like a newborn, along with the way he lovingly swoops in to save her later, sets up their relationship, exploring Civil War and beyond. Vision's name here comes from Thor. I've had a vision. Earlier in Thor's nightmare, he envisioned Vision's eyes opening, and that connection allows Vision to wield Mjolnir. Or is it the Infinity Stone? That's not really clear. Tony upgrades with Friday, named after Girl Friday in the movie His Girl Friday, a well-rounded office assistant. But notice his other cards. There's Jocasta, Ultron's wife in the comics, who turns on him and joins the Avengers, along with Takashi, the chip that's in Baymax in Big Hero 6. And then we return to Sokovia. That man is playing solitaire. Thought we wouldn't notice, but uh, we did. Ultron turns the city into a gravity meteor, and Cap gives his big rallying speech. You get hurt, hurt him back. You get killed, walk it off. The camera cuts to Pietro when he says, if you get killed, yeah, obviously foreshadowing the death, but it cuts to Wanda for, if you get hurt, hurt him back. And later, when Ultron breaks her heart by killing her brother, she rips out his heart. I love this a few years ago, some observant viewers on Reddit discovered that the shape of the tear that she makes in his chest matches the tear in Cap's shield in Tony's nightmare earlier. Other viewers noticed that back in Wanda's final scene with Pietro, they left one Ultron sentry still functioning, and that's the sentry that drops the city while Wanda is avenging Pietro. Vision discovers Ultron's final sentry and notice this Sentry's severed shoulder and chest. This is the same drone that Cap confronted earlier on the bridge. You can't save them all. You'll never. You never what? You didn't finish! And Ultron does get finished here. They're doomed. Yes. But a thing isn't beautiful because it lasts. It's a privilege to be among them. You're unbearably naive. Well, I was born yesterday. Of course, Ultron's death occurs off screen, and yeah, later in Homecoming, Peter Parker finds an Ultron head with its red eyes glowing, suggesting it could possess Ultron's consciousness there. We made a few videos on whether this guy could return. But we see the new upstate Avengers HQ. Nat sees Clint and Laura's baby named Nathaniel Pietro Barton. Now, Pietro obviously for Quicksilver, but Nathaniel for Natasha with Barton honoring Nat the way she honored him with her necklace in Winter Soldier. Fury reports on an unidentified ship crashing in the ocean, but we later learn Hulk took the Quinjet to Sakaar, so what is this ocean crash and why is it a Namor Easter egg? I know, Atlantis is in the Atlantic Ocean, this crash is in the Pacific, but it's all water. Tony says bye to Cap. Maybe I should take a page out of Barton's book, build Pepper a farm, hope nobody blows it up. The simple life, you get there one day. Both setting up their endpoints for Endgame. Stark retires to a farm. Cap goes home to his simple life. And the final shot shows War Machine, Vision, Falcon, Wanda. And we just learned that there was a deleted alternate ending with a stand-in for Captain Marvel in this lineup. But Cap blue balls us. Avengers! Incomplete ending for an incomplete movie. Again, act one of a three-act story which later peaks with Cap completing this iconic line in Endgame. Avengers! Assemble. No! The credits even show a story still in transition. An Iwo Jima-inspired statue of the Avengers triumphant on a rock, the inverse of their rock of failure in Tony's nightmare, but then it goes right into the foreboding stinger that kicks off act two of the story, which will be Infinity War. Fine. I'll do it myself. Ultron may or may not live on in the MCU, but on a symbolic level, Ultron represents the Avengers' blind spots, their folly in trying to encase the world in a suit of armor, their inevitable doom. In that sense, the Age of Ultron is an age that they will live in for years to come. How does Age of Ultron rank for you in the MCU? Now, it's definitely not fair to call this the worst MCU film, but is it top half or bottom half? Comment down below with your thoughts, and you can join future Infinity Saga watch-alongs on Discord by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash newrockstars. Follow me, follow New Rockstars, and subscribe to New Rockstars, because folks, I am coming back next week with the most important MCU installment.